Holy Post is sponsored by BioLogos and the Language of God podcast. We all come into contact with hard questions that don't have simple answers. We want to bring both science and Christian faith into engagement with these hard questions, not necessarily to find simple answers, but to grow through the process of exploration. That's what BioLogos and the Language of God podcast are all about. Language of God is a podcast about science and faith from BioLogos that dives deep into complex issues through inner Interviews and storytelling. The podcast explores questions like, what does it mean to be human? How should we respond to the climate crisis? How are we changed by technology? Featuring the voices of experts and thinkers, scientists and theologians, and several Holy Post guests like Jonathan Haidt, Esau McCauley, Curtis Chang, N.T. Wright, John Walton, and even me. Check out the Language of God podcast on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to the Holy Post. With both the election and polls getting closer, new research from LifeWay says a record number of pastors are refusing to say who they vote for, even on an anonymous survey. Mike Erie's back, and he says he wouldn't answer the survey either, and his reason may surprise you. Then Phil explores how Pat Buchanan's 1992 presidential campaign was a harbinger for today's politics. And diversity experts featured in Matt Walsh's new documentary claim that he lied to them to get them to participate in the film. Walsh says it's okay to lie for the greater good of winning the culture war. Is he right? Then Caitlin interviews America's government teacher and social media sensation Sharon McMahon about her new book, The Small and the Mighty. McMahon says history can give us hope and resilience to live faithfully in our divided times. Also this week, be careful— That's not an Oreo on the ground. Before we get into the episode, we've got something special. Today we're launching our newest show, the Esau Macaulay Podcast. Esau is one of our favorite people, and he's a perfect fit for Holy Post Media because he brings together so many divergent interests from biblical scholarship and comic book movies to political punditry and professional basketball. And he engages it all with equal bits of humor and wisdom. So to give you a little preview of the new show, I want to share a two-minute clip from this first episode of Esau Macaulay's podcast featuring his conversation with Nancy French about her gift for trash-talking. Take a listen. Yeah. One of my spiritual gifts not listed in First Corinthians is trash-talking. Um, <laughs> and I demonstrate it throughout all aspects of my life, including pickleball, but also like when I go to Walmart <laughs> and I want to beat David to the cashier with our little list. Like I am such a trash-talker and so is David French. Um, and uh, everyone in my family is sort of like we, we sort of deal like an acrimony. So I love it. Yeah. I think it's so fun. It makes everything more interesting. And so in this case, I just feel like it's because women are not characterized by that and so everyone was like uh what what was that excuse me i mean because you know there have been like some really i mean forgive me for saying so but like bill lambeer of the pistons back in the day like i maybe he's a great guy maybe he's (laughs) repented i don't know but like back in the day like you actually were like this person is really bad uh, yeah. And like, he's actually malicious in his play. And you just don't yeah. see that in this situation with these women. It's I, just I, not I, I want to I want to ask you how far like your trash talk went, because I think f- people who may not know is that I think did you recently get a, an all clear diagnosis with that? Like, yes. What, what is the status? Congratulations. Yeah. We've been praying for you. Yes. Thank We're you. happy to hear this. Brian, Thank Praise you, God. guys. So, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Four months ago, four weeks ago, I finished ra- radiation. I'm cancer free. Hallelujah. So were you talking trash? Because I know you played pickleball throughout the treatment. Were you talking trash while receiving cancer treatment and beating people in pickleball? Did you like ever take it there? Or did you have like some kind of... Esau's been reading the West Haven, my neighborhood's yeah. uh, Facebook page, complaining about the cancer patient who's out there saying, is that all you got? Did you just get beat by a cancer patient? Uh, or, you- or if like, for example, uh, you know, like we have six little courts all lined up. So like a ball, an errant ball would go through, you know, like my court and I'd have to go get it for the careless players who threw it. And I would toss it back to him and I'd say, that's okay. I have a certain amount of time left in life, but I'll, I'll spend it chasing. <laughs> your ball that's fine oh it's, i have nothing else to do besides chemo so go ahead oh man <laughs> oh my goodness that is hilarious. <laughs> i love it nancy angel reese has got nothing on me oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs>
So that's just a taste of what you're in for on Esau's new show. To help us launch this podcast, do me a favor and pause this episode right now. Then go to your podcast app and subscribe to the Esau Macaulay podcast right now. Go ahead. I'll wait. Okay, you did it? Wonderful. Now, after you listen, be sure to rate it and tell your network to sign up for the podcast as well. And thanks to everyone for helping us expand and grow the reach of funny, smart, faithful Christian voices like Esau's. Okay, here is Holy Post episode 636. Hey there, welcome back to the Holy Post podcast. This is Phil Vischer. I'm here with, yes. a, again with two people, neither named Caitlin. That, that happened like two weeks ago. I know. It's what's, a trend. Know. What's Caitlin doing? Is she, uh, did she take another job? Is she, did she go back to school and, and she has finals this week? What's going on? I, I think she's at a conference here in Chicago, isn't she? Oh, oh, she's, she's in town, so she can't be on the show. That's right. No, oh, that makes perfect sense. Something listen, like that. Listen, let me tell you right now, I, I am delighted to be on the JV and called up to the big time yeah. whenever she's she's not around. Yeah, Mike so, Erie is back. The Erie, yep. Erie comma yep. Mike. Did they did mm. people make fun of your last name in grade school? Did they, uh, they called me Lake, and that was about as original as Oh, because you were in Ohio? Exactly. Yeah. What an insult. I don't think that would have happened in many other states. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. But okay. yeah, that was it. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. That was it. Okay. Yeah, maybe maybe Michigan. We've got lots to cover today. Lots to cover. Lots. Lots to cover today. So uh, we're going to play the theme song. You know what's hey, not, you know what's I'm not playing covering the theme song lots here. right now? I'm playing the theme is song. Is your hairline. I'm playing the theme song. Do not talk to me about hairlines. Theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. The Holy Post is sponsored by the National Association of Evangelicals. Do you feel the tension in the air? Maybe it's at the dinner table or in your church or just anytime you hop on social media. In our increasingly divided country, disagreement has become hostility. So what's the role for Christians in this moment? How do we heal rifts and wrestle with complicated topics in a world that feels increasingly divided into sides and prefers simple sound bites over thoughtful engagement? The Difficult Conversations podcast hosted by Walter Kim, president of the National Association of Evangelicals, shares incredible stories of people who have stepped out of safe circles, sometimes into enemy territory, to build bridges and repair relationships. You'll hear from experts on why difficult conversations are so hard, how to have them, and why they matter for the kingdom of God. In the first episode, Jonathan Haidt, one of the world's foremost thinkers in social psychology, starts at the beginning and helps us understand why we are just so polarized. Look for the Difficult Conversations podcast on your favorite podcast app. Sky? Yes. What's up with the hat? I'm glad you asked, Phil. Thank you. I was in Denver this weekend mm -hmm. doing a bunch of different things, including our Holy Post event, which was great. It was wonderful meeting all kinds of people there. I also spoke at a church yesterday morning, Denver United, which was just a great community, wonderful people. But there was uh, a couple there who are on staff, Matthew and Adriana, and they got me a number of gifts, including this hat. Mm. And for those who are not watching this on YouTube, the hat has a cartoon version of Blucifer. Blucifer is the name that people have given to that giant blue stallion outside of the Denver airport mm -hmm. that has the glowing red eyes. That's Very super creepy. creepy. Very creepy. Yeah. <laughs> they gave me actually a, an info card with all kinds of information about Blucifer. Really? It's 30, mm. 32 feet tall. He's insured for $2 million. Apparently, he, he killed his creator when, it, when the horse I fell mean, on him. Really? It's very evil. But wow. I'm glad Mike's here because, uh, Mike, some months ago, you sent us a Voxology hat. I did. Not us. I sent you. You did. You sent me. Actually, he started I, referring to himself in plural. Seth's got the hat. I want him to throw the, throw the hat in here, Seth. Seth. Yep. There it is. Throw the hat. Oh, look at that. It's a it's a oh, it's a trucker thank you, hat. Sky. Oh, it right. is. There's some product placement for you. That's so great. Thank you. And Caitlin sent me a Swifty hat when I kept making fun of her love of Taylor Swift. <laughs> so <laughs> this has inspired me. I think what we should do is for our diehard Holy Post fans, 
send us a hat. Send us a hat, and if it's a good enough hat, I will wear it during a show. Mm. And you have to give us the story behind the hat that you are sending us. And we can start like a Holy Post hat collection. Hats are kind of big right now. If you haven't noticed, it's like dominated our politics for the last nine years. We're going to get freaking deluged with hats. Maybe. It's going to be the hat capopolypse. Let's just see what happens. Let's see what happens. But I was very appreciative of Adriana and Matt. They were very kind. And they they gave me this lovely hat for a memory of my time in Denver. Thanks for the hat, guys. They made made Lucifer like... Yeah, he's definitely cuter on the hat than in real life. In real life, he (laughs) he (laughs) scares my children if we fly. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're adults now, so I think they've gotten over it. But when we... So that's what we're going to do. Send us your hats. We're going to make a wall of hats of Holy Post fans. And you got to, you know, tell me why the hat should be worn on camera. We'll okay, out. that's fantastic. Hey, we got big news, real big news, giant news. Very excited about the big news today. You know our friend Esau Macaulay. He's been on the show a gazillion times. He's now actually a senior editor at the Holy Post, so he's doing all sorts of stuff with us. And um, he's launching his own show. It's called uh, it's the Esau Macaulay Podcast, right? I believe so. I believe that's yeah. what it's called. I believe it's called the Esau Macaulay Podcast and... It launch- hours and hours of workshopping that title. Yeah, it launches <laughs> as you listen to this on Wednesday, the twenty fifth. It launches today, right now, today. as you're listening Ooh. to this. So while you're listening to the Holy Post podcast, don't stop listening to the Holy Post podcast, of course, because why would you do that? But go over and subscribe mm. to the Esau Macaulay podcast because it's going to be great. And he's going to he's going to pick his own guests, have his own conversations, do his own thing. It's going to be fantastic. Um, and you're going to love it. So sign up for the Esau Macaulay podcast, wherever fine podcasts are sold, but ideally on Apple Podcasts, because then it, that generates the, um, you know, the algorithms and the numbers and the, the people and the interest. And tell in, your friends, post on Facebook. Oh, yeah. Twitter, do X, o- do other stuff. threads, wherever, Instagram. Get the word out. Wherever find are there podcast hats? listeners are there hats are found. involved? There should be. There should be hats involved. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the logo's and, you know, cool. The the, for, the art is cool. I like it. For people who who maybe have only heard Esau here or don't know him super well, first of all, he's a New Testament professor at Wheaton College. He studied under N.T. Wright. He is a New York Times columnist. He's written some amazing best-selling books that have gotten all kinds of accolades wherever you go. He's also an Anglican priest. What? Yeah, wow. yeah, he's got it all going on. He's amazing. I've been angling for an Anglican around here. Mm. Yeah. Mike, have mm. you listened to the new podcast yet? Is it, do you want to give your uh, review of the new podcast that hasn't launched yet? I think it's going to be incredible. Okay. And I will like, subscribe, rate, and share. Wow. There you go. Holy. It's got all four. Yep. The tri- Holy that's the mackerel. quadfecta. That getting yeah, that that's from right. Mike, that's pretty amazing. From, no, I don't from do that. Mike do Erie. anybody. That's yeah. just uh, amazing. Okay. B- yeah. In honor of Mike being here and Caitlin not <laughs> being here, it's time for News of the Butt. And now it's time for News of the Butt. There it is. Now, I'm going to say three words that you wouldn't necessarily put together in a, se- <laughs> a sentence. Okay. <laughs> Trap door. That's word number one. Ravine, hmm. that's word number two. Spider, that's word number three. Okay, hmm. now, how do you think those three words affect one another in this story? There's a species of spider that lives in a ravine and they have those like trapdoor little holes in the ground that things fall into and then the spider gets them. Isn't there a kind of spider that does that? He's so good. Wow. Am I good? Am that's I so on good. right? Yeah. It's it's that's literally the name of the spider. The trapdoor ravine spider. There you go. Boom. Yeah. I just I thought I was gonna I was know. gonna talk about an outhouse. Yeah, I okay. thought maybe we'll we could Sky. have a little fun with that, but no, we're not gonna have any no. fun with that at all because Sky uses his Crushed towering it. intellect to just hit the pickleball right out of the court and I can't even oh. go get it now to hit it back because this is rolling nope. through the parking lot. At Denny's. Yeah. Okay. If you've ever found a small burrow in the ground with a trap door made of dirt, leaves, and other debris, and if you're in the southeastern United States, particularly mm. in Georgia, you may mm. have stumbled upon the burrow of a, of a ravine trapdoor spider. Ravine 
trapdoor spider. Oh, they say it two different ways in the same article. They say trapdoor ravine spider and ravine trapdoor spider. Wow, I'm confused. Get it together, science. I just lost all faith in you. Here's the headline of the article. Trapdoor ravine spider's butt easily mistaken for Oreo cookie. I'm just going to lay that out there. I mean, you should have led with that. You should have led with trapdoor butt and Oreo cookie. That's <laughs> those are the words you should have led with. This fascinating and unusual looking spider can be easily identified by its flat butt that looks like an Oreo cookie. You got to okay, right. look it up. I'm pulling it up. I'm pulling look it up. Look it up. Oreo My cookie butt. My accountability software will not Trap allow this. Trapdoor <laughs> <laughs> ravine without notifying your pastor yeah yeah yeah, spider. yeah, 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 yeah. okay trapdoor ravine yeah, spider oreo oreo yeah. cookie butt yep you see it oh my gosh yeah i know oh my gosh <laughs> that is the cre- that is crazy <laughs> i don't I why know. is it like that i don't know i don't know i don't know it looks why like it got like cut that. looks like it got cut in half like just psh. yeah it's just flat it's just completely flat yeah. so it can make a little trap door isn't god amazing god said <laughs> i want a spider that looks like a cookie that hasn't even been invented yet so i'm going to make atheists. the spider first <laughs> checkmate i'm going to make the spider first and later That's they'll right. make the cookie and then someone right. will make the connection and i will look like a genius <laughs> wow Yep. Yeah. Okay. Someone someone has actually made an image and put the Oreo logo on the butt of the spider. Wow. That's it's cool. on, Yeah. All right. And it looks like it belongs there. So I hope you're all looking it up at home so you can laugh along at home. And, uh, yep. and then we will say that's enough for now. It has been the news of the butt. This has been the news of the butt. Okay. Wow. We're back again. I'm still amazed. Still amazed. Still amazed. Mm-hmm. We need to talk about something. Half of pastors, according to a new survey, half of pastors plan to vote Speaking for... Speaking of news of the butt. News of the... <laughs> Mike, don't try to get me in trouble. Don't come onto my podcast and try to get me in trouble. <laughs> you can try to get me in trouble from your podcast. <laughs> Not from my podcast. Half of pastors plan to vote for Trump. Nearly a quarter, though, and this is kind of what the story is about for me, nearly a quarter of pastors refuse to say in a survey that I assume was anonymous. Why don't you have to sign your name on it and then let people dig into it? Almost all U.S. Protestant pastors, 97%, plan to vote in the 2024 presidential election, according to LifeWay Research. But almost a quarter refuse to answer the question of whom they'll cast a ballot for. Now, for comparison, in 2016, only 3% wouldn't answer the question, who do you plan to cast your Mm. ballot for? In 2020, only 4% refused to answer the question, who are you going to cast your ballot for? In 2024, it shot up to almost a quarter. Say, I'm not telling you that. I'm not telling you that. Get away from me, Lifeway. Mm. Get away. I'm not Mm. even talking about this. The growing number of pastors unwilling to respond with their voting intentions, this is the head of Lifeway Research speaking, shows how sensitive or divisive politics has become in some churches. Okay, Mike Erie. It is also interesting just just to say, you know, look at the numbers and say half of pastors are going to vote for Trump, which also means Mm -hmm. half aren't. So, you know, Christianity is not in the bag for Donald Trump, like most people assume. Well, Mm. to be clear, this is just Protestant pastors. Yes, that's true. And number two, if if it's roughly 50% for Trump, what is it, about 25% for Harris and 25% who won't say? Yeah. Okay, well... No, 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 no. That's, that's, I think, um, no, it's 25% are, are undecided. Right, right, right. This it's 20, is, this so is of the, the group people who that did will say, say, yes. Right. Okay. Got but that, it. Okay. That 50% for Trump, it, I mean, it's not, the, the polls say the race is very close. And, a, you know, 40 something percent to 50% are gonna, of Americans overall are going to vote for Trump. So it seems like maybe pastors are just falling into the similar breakdown as the population except, at large. Except that they're not, Sky. Except that they're not. Evangelical oh. pastors, <laughs> 61% are going to vote for Trump, self-reported. But mm-hmm. that's 20 points lower 
than evangelical support for Trump. Mm -hmm. So that's, although we don't know how many of the, I don't want to talk about it are, are they, I don't want to talk about it because right. they're voting for Trump and they just don't want to mention it or because they won't vote for Trump, but they know how much trouble that will get them in. I assume I, that's that was my group. question when I saw these stats is, is in that, I don't want to talk about it group. Yeah. Why don't they want to talk about yeah. it? Yeah. And who are they worrying about hearing it? And what do they think the backlash would be? Yeah. So, okay. One of us on the show today is actually a pastor with an actual congregation that he actually gets <laughs> up in front of every Sunday. So Mike, mm, from, yes. from your experience as a pastor in front of yes. people in a red yes. state... What, yes. what do you make of uh, these results and, and the number, the, the radically increasing number of pastors who don't want to talk about it? Uh, first of all, I am voting for Ross Perot. He has been a consistent <laughs> theme. Do you on, know, what, on, do you know uh, what we forget about Ross Perot? Uh, the, what? what I we forget? There, that his butt looks just like an Oreo cookie. Mm. You don't remember that? And we're back. <laughs> And it's full circle. <laughs> okay, Mike, go ahead. Sorry. I just, you know. Send Sky a Ross Perot 92 hat. If oh, anyone, I would take it. The young kids, one. the young kids that weren't around wouldn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. wouldn't remember know, that. They don't know what about, we're talking about. about but All right. So, so um, I, I don't know if this is true where you guys are at, but uh, the very sad state of affairs, at least in my very limited experience, is that uh, your your vote for who should run one of the kingdoms of the world is now a test of allegiance to Jesus. And so um, why would you uh, condescend to that very basic tribal lowest common denominator when, um, when no one's really willing to put up with nuance and thoughtfulness, even in church context? So and do you, do you I, see that as having grown in the last eight years? Absolutely. Okay, oh yeah. my goodness. Yes. Ab but, absolutely. But Mike, if you got an anonymous survey asking you who you're going to vote for, mm -hmm. would you not want to answer that? Correct. I would not. You wouldn't answer that, even an anonymous no. survey. No, because even the survey results are doing something that I just don't think is helpful to the church. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So what, the, I, I don't, I, I would, I would, uh, I would on principle say, that is not so, that is not something pastors should be doing, um, even in anonymous survey polls saying, "Hey, this is how pastors are going to vote." Do you think that's why the number of non-respondents went from three percent or two percent, whatever it was, to twenty-five? Because they they suddenly found this principle that no, we shouldn't <laughs> be engaged in this. I, if I believe the best, yes, but no, I don't think that's the I don't think that's the reason. Uh, I think so the reason is? is well, I think the reason is is the tribal affiliations and associations that that you you guys experience this all the time, like on the abortion issue, right? You came out with the abortion explainer video filled with nuance, filled with research, and n no one's willing to sit in that tension with you. It's either it's either you're you're liberals or you guys are far too left or right or whatever it is. Um, I I think that that. Pastors who want to shepherd mixed, politically mixed congregations are wise enough to know um, that alienating half of your congregation isn't really the wise way to go. For those who, one of the things that's true here, and I, I would imagine elsewhere, is if you really want to grow a church these days, just pick a partisan flavor and, and baptize it with Bible verses, and your church will go, go like crazy. But if you're trying so, to live in, go ahead. Okay, no, I agree with you entirely on that. But but that that's to, it's one thing to get up in front of your church and say I'm voting for Harris or I'm voting for Trump. It's another thing yeah. to get an anonymous survey. You're probably and refuse just, to answer. You're it. probably just concerned. Uh, is this really anonymous? Is this is this traceable no. in some way? No, you know. Concerned about that? I don't know. Are you asking for me, or do you no, ask for what them? I think? For them? For them? them? Ask, yeah. Oh, are they them. saying? I don't know if I trust Lifeway Research because it is the Southern Baptist Convention, and they want me to tell them who I'm voting for, and that makes me really uncomfortable. There, I think there are a significantly higher number of people eight years later who are uncomfortable with the idolatry inherent in even the the ways that those questions are phrased and so my hope is the majority of those who are not answering are not answering 
because uh, they're they're recognizing that's just not helpful information yeah. for the church to have. Yeah. Now, so now evangelical support for Trump hasn't really gone down at all in the last eight years, which is no. disturbing. But it's except still, except among clergy, right? I mean, still that's, around what, that's part it of the It was never sub-story. super high among clergy. It was never right. super high oh. am, among clergy. I remember a survey, you know, during the 2015 primary and 90% of, of clergy and evangelical leaders said they were opposed to the Trump candidacy. Um, mm. And then they found out that that was not a good idea to say that out loud <laughs> and be quoted in Christianity Today saying that out oh. loud. So everyone kind of change their tune. Right. Because I, they're not shepherds or anything. They're not leading flocks. Hey, they're hey, trying hey, to figure hey, out hey, where hey, the, don't, don't, you know, hey, 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 be where, nice. where are oh, the people hey, going hey, oh, so that I might lead them? Here's what's here's, salt and pepper. Here's what's most striking is is um the racial divide on this. Because all Christians mm. should think the same, right? All Christians mm-hmm. should be dealing with the Bible, the Bible. The Bible tells us what to think and how to vote. And yet, evangelical pastors, 61% support Donald Trump, 10% support Kamala Harris. So 10% of evangelical pastors will go on record saying they're voting for Kamala Harris. African-American pastors, 71% say they're voting for Kamala Harris. Only Hmm. 5% of African-American pastors will go on record saying they're voting for Donald Trump. So Mm -hmm. if you have found one or the other of these candidates or parties um, anointed by God, it is really hard to explain why black pastors and evangelical, which is mostly white, like 90% white pastors, disagree so significantly on which one Mm -hmm. is the one. Didn't Al Mohler say something about this a couple of years ago? Yes, he said, he said, but I, he wasn't talking about black clergy. He just said black people vote for Trump or vote uh, a Democrat for historic reasons. Which, which is a, was another, but he, in the same interview or whatever writing he did there, he was saying that faithful Christians had to vote yes. for Trump yes. or vote Republican It was or an unfaithful mm-hmm. vote to vote for a Democrat. Right. Yes. So then when he yes. was asked, well, what about... Black Christians who eh. vote Democrat. Eh, it's just, so what they get a pass in his mind because eh. because of historical <laughs> history. <laughs> I just it seemed bizarre. His, I think what so... he was saying was history makes them unfaithful with their vote. And so, that's certainly the implication. Certainly the implication. Okay, so um, how's it going in your church, Mike? Because you've been actually preaching on politics. Do you know what you know? One of the things that was super interesting is we did a. Um, kind of a, an exercise I, uh, around who's your enemy? Like, who do you consider your enemy and, and what it would, you know, be like just to pray a blessing over them? And um, and we had people write down who they considered their enemy, and then they would put that down in a basket and pick up the bread and the cup. Um, did, anyone, did anyone say Mike Erie? <laughs> we blocked those out, and that was a significant portion. And so I was hoping you wouldn't ask that, but yes. Mm. But it was fascinating. During our staff meeting, we'd kind of read over these and pray over these. It was about 50-50. For those who did mention p- politicians, it was about 50-50 each way. And we were very encouraged by that. Um, because one of the things we talk a lot about is is... The, if the kingdom can hold the tax collector and the zealot, then the kingdom can hold the hardcore Trump fan and the hardcore Biden-Harris fan. Here's my question about that, because I agree with you, Mike. The kingdom can hold two of Jesus, you know, Matthew the tax collector and, and Judas the zealot. But did they remain a zealot and a tax collector? That's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, and And I don't... I don't know. Um, I would I would suggest though that over the course of the however many years they they spent with Jesus, their tribal affiliations lessened absolutely because what Jesus mm-hmm. was offering, and this is I think where you're going, Sky, Jesus was offering an alternative political future, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But it didn't start there. So I consider it success in the polarized culture that we're at least starting. Um, with a community in the midst of a you know a series we've been doing on the kingdom and politics with people who are you know I mean one of the things we were announcing is you're taking communion next 
to people who love the candidate you hate. And so what, what are the implications of that for Jesus following? Now, the goal is that, is that that would change over the course of time just the way it did for, for Simon and, um, and Matthew. So absolutely, that's not where we want to end up. But I, I will take starting there as a good thing. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. I was going to wrap it up and move to the next story because I feel like we covered it from every possible angle that it <laughs> could be covered from. And, and now the, the, the burrow door is closed with the Oreo <laughs> cookie butt. Okay. 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 And okay. we're back. And we're actually, okay. Do we want to stay on that idea and push that a little further or do we want to switch up because i've got two more stories and we usually only get we usually get to one short of the number of stories i want to get to mm. so how, how are we supposed to know phil we're flying blind here <laughs> no you I, gotta sell, pick. I sent you the stinking stories dude <laughs> we're not flying yeah, blind. i don't pay attention okay the gop's i'm i'm making the call myself i'm making an audible the do gop's it. slow turn from American evangelicalism. This is written by Mark Silk. Uh, he writes in Religion News uh, Service, RNS. Um, and he's talking about, uh, was that for RNS or for Mark Silk? No, RNS. Okay. Should, should Blucifer have gotten one of those? Oh, I mean, yeah. I no, but how Oreo should have. I, did, I didn't have it ready oh, for, yeah. Even if it's just a butt that looks like an Oreo. Yeah. It's still, it's still a, a brand. What? No. Velveeta? You're not just throwing out brand names here for me to ring a bell. I'm not doing it. Not doing so, it. So you saw it coming. You saw it okay, coming. So, okay, go so ahead. he go, lists go. some stories. There was a recent New York Times piece um, about Christian activists that were becoming discouraged at the lack of progress they felt they were now making in Republican politics. Um, another one about conservative Catholics moving away from the idea that we have to ban abortion and now adopting incrementalism and saying, well, let's just make it a little less frequent. And that's discouraging uh, to, to more conservative Catholics who want to push for full abolition. And then another story about how no one sees Paula White anymore around Donald Trump. And she was his spiritual advisor previously, and she was the one who put together his spiritual support team, a fairly controversial Pentecostal um, pastor. She's the one who was calling for angels from Africa, yes, right? Yes, angels from yeah, Africa. Correct. You yeah. are, and they you showed up right. last I checked. And she seems to have been replaced, Mark S Silk points out, by uh, conspiracy-mongering internet celebrity Laura Loomer to be in her mm. inner circle. So Christians are are getting frustrated and, and having less visibility. And a lot of people pointed out the uh, GOP platform in the convention mm -hmm. dropped yeah. things that were really important to conservative Christians. Uh, and he, he says, and this is interesting, he says, Trump phoned into a prayer call of the National Faith Advisory Board, which was put together by Paula White for him five years ago. And uh, he called in, they do these prayer calls, he called in the day before his debate with Vice President Kamala Harris. And this is what he talked about on the prayer call. He didn't bring up religious liberty. He didn't bring up abortion. Those weren't the things that were important for him that he wanted them to get riled up about. He said about Kamala Harris, every day she's flooding our country with millions and millions of criminal, illegal aliens and wants to make them citizens. And I'm quoting, yeah. she wants to have them vote, which will destroy the voting power of Christian conservatives forever. And once that starts happening, and once you get those numbers involved, you lose everything that you have. So, hey, Christians, if more yeah. immigrants come in from majority Christian countries, it will end what Christians have in America. <sighs> Mark Silk points out that, in fact, illegal migrants to the U.S. coming mostly from Latin America and the Caribbean are overwhelmingly Christian, more Christian than the American population, and religiously conservative to boot. In fact, in Springfield, Ohio, that goes especially for, uh, this goes especially <laughs> for Haitians, of whom more than 90% are Christian. Hmm. So he links it back to um, changes that came about with, um, um, hang on. First of all, that's a great use of a prayer call. So let's just agree there. <laughs> if I was um, on that call, I would have been praying. <laughs> he, links yes, it, yes. he links it back with um, Pat Buchanan's campaign in 1992, 
where you had Reagan, who was extremely pro-immigrant, couldn't stop talking about how immigrants were the strength of America and we needed new waves of immigrants, you know, every so often to make America younger and more innovative. And that that was the key to why America was what it was. In 1992, former Nixon speechwriter Pat Buchanan challenged Reagan's successor, George H.W. Bush, for the presidential nomination. Buchanan ran a populist campaign with the old isolationist slogan, America first, uh, and a staunchly anti-immigrant message. So uh, the Buchanan campaign revived the American nativist tradition, harking back to the know-nothings of the 1850s, white working-class Protestants who opposed Catholic immigration from Ireland and Germany, partly out of economic anxiety. So in 2016, Donald Trump took up the Buchananite banner of anti-immigrant isolationism. In due course, marrying it to the religious right by choosing Mike Pence as his running mate and pledging to appoint Supreme Court justices who would overturn Roe v. Wade. But in post-Roe America, the MAGA movement is proving to be more nativist than Christian, more America first, which is the Pat Buchanan line, than shining city on a hill, which was the Reagan line. So Mark Silk's contention is that the GOP has turned on Christians who have been almost universally, um, well, generally, majority at least, welcoming to outsiders, welcoming to immigrants, and has made it a nativist movement, and which leaves many Christians on the outside looking in. Lucifer? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's a couple things to point out here. First of all, and we've cited this study numerous times, LifeWay did a study about voters in 2016, I think the study came out in 2018, asking evangelical, white evangelical voters what issues were most important to them in yeah. determining their vote. And abortion, I think, was number seven on the list. Yeah. It was not even yeah. in the top five. And what that. was at the top? Economics and immigration. And mm -hmm. so this idea that Christians are suddenly caring more about immigration than about abortion is not new. That was true eight years ago. It was probably mm. true before that even. So um, I think Trump and maybe his political advisors have done some calculus and realized we're not going to lose any evangelical votes by getting rid of the abortion issue from the platform. We're not going to lose many evangelical votes if we aren't talking tons of pro-life rhetoric, because ultimately what that contingency group wants more than anything, or that constituency group wants more than anything else, is this immigration issue to be dealt with. So he's he's wow. He's not ignorant to the data and I think he's following. Okay, it. okay. So towering towering what? intellect. Oh, towering. Tower. Tower. That's a tough I, word to say. Tower. That's a tough word. I towering. Tower. 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 Ring. It's yeah. intellect. Right. Sure. Um I was going to say something that was brilliant and Mike was probably going to mm. fall backwards out of his chair after I said it mm. and I mm -hmm. can't Oh. Oh, oh, <laughs> something that uh, Pat Buchanan brought to life uh, and wrote oh! about. <laughs> wrote about there goes Mike. It happened. It, it was premature. Just to hold, hold a little bit longer. Um, was the notion that we were in a civilizational struggle, you know, mm -hmm. that Western mm -hmm. civilization was in danger and that immigration was the thing that could bring down Western civilization. Mm. Uh, mm. That was so profoundly un Reaganite. You know, it's just kind of the opposite. He felt that America's strength mm. was immigration and pulling people from right. all over the world. It's funny that, that Donald Trump just recently, a couple of days ago, um, said, we've got people coming from Africa, we got people coming from Asia, we got people coming from the Middle East, and we got to get them out of here. We got to get mm. them out of here. And, and it was mm. kind of obvious which part of the world he did not point to <laughs> to say <laughs> yeah. we've got to, which was the white parts of well, the world. Uh, Reagan, though, Reagan's boogeyman was communism. And so his way of thinking about the world was if somebody wants to come to America because we're free and prosperous and there's opportunity and you can worship as you want and say what you want and vote how you want, if that person wants to come to America and not be part of the communist world, great. He was all for it. But Pat Buchanan and Donald Trump, they didn't see communism as the great threat to America. They saw race and culture as the great threats. They were trying to protect whiteness, not capitalism 
And so mm. therefore, brown people coming into the country or non-Christians coming into the country was the great threat. And that's mm. obviously communism is not the great threat anymore. And so we're left with this nativism. Right, mm. except what's, what's um, Kamala, Kamala Harris's big problem? She's a communist. She's a Marxist. Mm. That's what Donald Trump says. So clearly yeah, communism is the enemy. Sky Jatani, Lucifer. I think what the, the irony is Trump has accused her of being a Marxist, a communist, and a fascist. And anybody who knows anything about political history and philosophy knows that those things exist on opposite ends of you the political can't. spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. he, he is just saying basically what he's trying to say is he's trying to make her scary and dangerous. And he's, and, yeah. and, 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 and Laura Loomer, that interesting woman, let me just say that, has said that if Kamala Harris gets into the White House, it's going to smell like curry, which is yeah. her way of othering Kamala and, and throwing out mm -hmm. this nativist immigrant trope. And it, so I think Trump's thing is not that he's threatening that she's a communist. He's trying to make her scary and make her un-American by highlighting so, her mm -hmm. ethnicity and her... Anyway, okay. so it's the same thing. He's just not smart enough to figure out know, that he's saying contradictory though, things. Do you know where else I see this this um, call for civilizational defense. We must defend Western civilization against the evil that's trying to destroy it, is the Christian far right. Uh, I see it a lot with the kind mm -hmm. of guys, you know, young men on the Christian far right who support Trump, um, who are MAGA and are extremely anti-immigrant. And the no, and that's where you see you know people writing about Christendom all of a sudden, and then how much we miss Christendom when the yeah. world was a kingdom of of Christians run by Christians, and we need to get back to that. So there's a big effort to move back towards a Christian mm -hmm. civilization, which immigrants, even Christian ones, are seen as an enemy of because they don't practice the kind of Protestantism and the kind of yeah, um, not even democracy, but just they don't have our cultural values. Yeah, but be clear, Christendom was about European domination. Uh, uh huh. Well, Christian and there and Christendom yeah, did exist with Roman Catholicism. It's not that it was just Northern yeah. European Protestantism. Yeah, we don't even like Catholics. the Roman. But but look at how many look at how many conservative intellectuals are converting to Catholicism. I know, like but that's JD my point. Vance, and then fighting for Western civilization. Right, but what, whether you say Western civilization or you say Christendom, whatever, what you're really saying is we want European people of European mm. heritage to run everything and dominate the culture. It's still about race. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Ooh, can I ask a question? Yes, Mike Erie. Besides that one, um, I, I, my experience isn't that it's that it's that that opinion is held just in the far right. That that seems like a pretty mainstream opinion that immigration is a threat to um civilization uh, america's greatness yeah i mean i i'm i'm shocked at the not only the study that sky cited in the 2018 study about how important immigration is but even now the like my my son dates uh his girlfriend is um goes to a college in springfield ohio and they've they've shut down all of the athletics for a week, all the classes, because people have been threatening to shoot up the, the campuses. And there is such power in that anti-immigrant rhetoric. Mm -hmm. I don't, I just reacted when you said far right. I'm like, no, I, well, I think it's I said, bigger I than I said that. Christian far right, Mike Erie. Oh, well, then let me say, okay. I think it's bigger than just the Christian far right. I think it's, I think that's a, that is a subtle um, or not so subtle mainstream Christian position these days. And that's what's, we call it by other things to Sky's point about Christendom, mm -hmm. but that's what's underneath, I think, mm -hmm. a lot of the dialogue. Absolutely. And and to be fair, and we've said this many, many times, and we've reported on it with folks from the Holy Post, like the immigration system in the United States is really broken. Mm -hmm. It It is... It's harming Americans, it's harming immigrants, it's harming people who are trying to get here legally. It's unfair even to the people who are entering illegally. Like the whole system is just a flipping mess. Mm -hmm. And it definitely needs over overhaul. And it's a very legitimate political concern that people should be discussing and a presidential candidate should have a plan to how to fix it. So I don't wanna say that this is an illegitimate concern that people have. It's what's beneath the concern. 
And you can come at our broken immigration system the way Ronald Reagan did and say, well, immigration is ultimately a good thing for this country. It's a necessary thing for our economy and our and our thriving culture. Or you can come at it and say, whether it's legal or illegal, I just want to stop brown people from coming into this country who don't think and live like I do. And if that's the posture, well, that's profoundly unchristian yeah. and problematic. Yeah. Okay. So here's what I'm going to summarize. Here's what I'm going to summarize. Okay. Um, we've seen the GOP go from Reagan shining city on a hill, give us your poor, your huddled, your, you know, everybody, to Trump's, what, but actually Pat Buchanan's America first. So, so Pat Buchanan won posthumously. Um, now what we're seeing is that uh, America first, the Pat Buchanan nativism attempting to make, rather than make America great again, make Christianity less Christian for the benefit mm. of this political project. So you're, you're seeing people trying to justify, this is why Christians mm -hmm. need to be against refugee resettlement programs. This is why Christians, because mm -hmm. it's love of neighbor. It's love of your white neighbors. And I've actually heard people say that, you know, to me, mm. you don't love your white neighbors. You only love your brown criminals that are coming across the border. Damn. So, and, so, and people who've been emptied out of asylum. Yes. Yeah, so, so Pat Buchanan, America <laughs> firstism corrupted mm. the GOP and now that movement within the GOP is attempting to corrupt the church there. I wouldn't say yeah. attempting. Corrupting. I think it's been happening, I, think, I mean, a long yeah. time. Okay. I, I think the GOP maneuver is a reflection of the corruption of the church, not the cause of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you sure? You really you think it started in the church and then spread to the GOP? Absolutely. I, I think the conflation of, of Christian faith with political I, identity has been going on for decades and decades yeah. and decades. Yeah. It's just now yeah. it has this... Sky the, the, and I. Yep. But people, yeah. yep. people become tend to become in their political beliefs on both sides, left and right. I almost said east and west. What if we just changed it to east and west? <laughs> You're an eastist. I'm more of a westist. Um, yeah. That... When you stop going to church, when you stop, the churches were actually a moderating influence right. on people's political beliefs. So I just think some of this extremism is coming more from, you know, twi people on Twitter in their basements that don't have interactions with a whole lot of other people during their days and then start the Daily Wire and then they're talking to a gazillion people. That's where I think it's coming from more than it's not. I don't think it's starting in the churches, Mike Erie. I'm pushing back on that. Oh, I will push back on your pushback. You when don't 87 know. to you, 90 percent, you don't know. Um, swallow hook, line, and sinker. Um, but it the, has to come from the, somewhere, not from in. Yeah, it's not coming from pastors, except a couple nut jobs. No, no, no. It is coming from pastors, but it's not. It's not coming as political talk. It's coming as gospel talk or Bible talk, or it's coming as um, culture war talk. But, All of those conflations, dam they start in the church and damage it. But, Absolutely. But Mike, only 60% of pastors, of even evangelical pastors, support Donald Trump. Was so, that true uh, eight years ago? It was less. I think it was less than that eight uh, years. Was that true know. during Reagan? I mean, how, how often, I Phil? I don't know. I mean, it was to, to be evangelical just meant to be Republican. Yes, but part of being Republican meant welcoming the stranger because... Uh, our big business uh, impulses need the labor, and we want a bigger, m more robust economy, and we want more consumers, and we like the notion that we're a shining city on the hill with our yeah. beacon pulling in everybody from everywhere, and they'll come, and they'll be, become Americans, and we'll be more dynamic, and we'll probably be more Christian because they'll go to church. Yes, because, because in your own words, Filbert, yeah. yes. you... As as you have argued, Christians were asked to baptize capitalism, oh, yeah. right? That's a failure of discipleship. That's not that's not that's not just something that's happening out there that all of a sudden Christians go, oh yeah, this is 
No, this is a failure of discipleship all the way back. But we so had the reason there was such fertile ground for Reagan's argument is yeah. because we'd already embraced capitalism as the Christian way. Yeah, because otherwise right. it was the communists that were going to exactly. ruin everything. Exactly. That, that's what we need to go back to is you go back to the 70s or the 80s oh. and churches may not have been demonizing immigrants or saying we shouldn't resettle refugees, but there was a lot of Christian rhetoric demonizing communism. Yeah. Come that on. was the great threat. And so now with that gone in the dust heap of history, there had to be a new boogeyman. <laughs> and the new boogeyman is is what Pat Buchanan was advocating, which was essentially Christian nationalism. And we have to now demonize immigrants and people who are coming from outside the country with other faiths. And that's now the great threat. So I think the pattern is the same. The church is always kind of hitched itself to a political ideology and demonizing the perceived enemy of that ideology. It's just now it has all this racial tinge to it with immigration. But the American church, the evangelical church has been doing this throughout ever since World War II. Doing yeah, what? Phil? You, just... it, pick, pick, hitching itself to a political ideology yeah. and sharing an enemy with that ideology. It's <laughs> just that during Reagan's time, the enemy was communism. <laughs> And today it's immigration. What about leftists? What about those nasty leftists? Hey, is it okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna jam in the fourth story if it kills me. Do it. Is it wow? Is it okay to lie if it helps me own the libs? That's what for a Christian. Is it okay for a Christian to lie if it helps me own the libs? Matt Walsh's film Am I Racist was released in theaters across the country last Friday. It did pretty well. It uh, only cost three million to make. Did five million opening weekend. The film lampoons diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and features Walsh posing with with a wig. He's wearing a wig and glasses, mm. on his real glasses. So no one is. He's like he's like Clark Kent. Is like, those aren't your glasses. I have no idea who you are. Wouldn't it be great if Superman was bald and Clark Kent wore a wig? Yeah, that would be great. Yes, thank you. The That's my the Superman. The film lampoons diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and features Walsh posing as a DEI expert to expose and ridicule actual DEI experts in a Borat-style subterfuge. And mm. if there's anything we need more in the Christian world, it's Borat-style subterfuge. subterfuge. Uh, mm -hmm. that engages DEI proponents who are unaware that Walsh is not who he says he is. Robin D'Angelo, one of the targets of the film, came out and said that Walsh lied to her to get her to take part in the film. Walsh said he didn't actually lie, but simply told her that he was making a documentary about anti-racism. We don't know who's right, but it sparked a conversation online among Christians saying, is that okay? And Denny Burke wrote a piece, actually I was reading from Denny Burke's piece, who's the, the head of uh, the Center for Biblical Womanhood and Manhood, so ultra conservative, but he pushed back and said, I think it's wrong to use subterfuge and deception just you know, for culture war battles. And other people said, oh, what, do you think it's wrong to lie to the Nazis that you've got Jews in your attic? This I is, knew that was coming. <laughs> these are <laughs> totally, serious totally. times. It warrants serious measure. So you, you mm -hmm. both are one current and one former pastor. I want you to tell me, when is it okay for me to lie to achieve what I consider to be a good? Mike Erie, go. Well, I'm lying that I'm enjoying this. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just, <laughs> obviously you've got examples of, of lying in the Bible, you know, mm -hmm. contrary to the... Mm -hmm. um, Come into my tent, sir. I am not going to do anything with this tent peg that totally, I'm holding totally, in my left totally. hand. I like I the Rahab that, story. Yeah, Rahab is it? Yes, yeah. yes. The Egyptian midwives, um, and mm -hmm. God blessed them because of their mm -hmm. deception. So, yep. and, or even the the Magi, um, their lies of omission. So, mm -hmm. so is it is it possible to to practice deception for a greater good? Uh, absolutely, it is, and we have mm -hmm. examples of it. Um, it em employed in culture war. The, th the quote that jumped out to me from that article, Phil, which I read ahead of oh, time, by yes, the way. You yes. sent ahead of time and I read. I forgot to read um, that quote. Let me read it. I got it right go here. Go ahead. This, yep. was, this was the kicker from Matt Walsh because Matt Walsh pushed back and said, and said, I have no regrets about the methods we used and would happily do it again. And then he added, the real dividing line is between those of us who are willing to do what it takes to win the culture war and those of us who are not. Oh. Yep. 
Yep. There and there and there that is the dividing line. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That is exactly the dividing line. That is very true. So you, you agree. You're saying you're, you're going on record to say you agree with Matt Walsh. In one very narrow respect, you cannot follow the Sermon on the Mount and engage in a culture war. Yes. So there is a dividing line. Absolutely. Um, we, so, so there is this, you know, principle in Judaism about what it is when you, when you save a life, you save the world. And so to deceive in order to protect life, I mean, I'm all for it. Absolutely. To deceive my wife when she asks, you know, did I put a lot of thought into Valentine's day? That's self-preservation. I'm all for that too. <laughs> um, <laughs> to deceive in order to own the libs. May it never be, Phil. May it never well, and, be. And let's be clear. It's not just deceive to own the libs. It's deceive to own the libs that in a movie that you will make millions of dollars distributing. Mm -hmm. So there is yeah. a self-interest in here. There's well, a financial it's, interest it's in also, this. It's also, yeah, it's deceiving for entertainment value. Exactly. Because there, there are a whole bunch of other ways that you could get, make a point that you disagree with diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, right? Other than making fun of the people who promote them for money. So, okay, so we're yeah. pretty sure. So we're not exactly sure where the line is, but we're pretty sure. We're, we're sure we're getting close to Denny on this one. Pretty sure the Ten yes. Boom family yes. is on one line, and Matt Walsh is on the other <laughs> line. Yeah, but that 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 quote that he has at the end, I think that. It's not just about lying and it's not just about this movie, obviously. This right. is this is the ethic that animates That's so much right. of the Christian subculture right now. It That's is right. if you inflate their fear that everything is on the line, the world is gonna burn, the country is gonna be destroyed, the churches are gonna be taken over, your children are gonna be, you know, forced out of school to have a sex change operation, whatever. Like these are things yeah. that are being told to people. If everything is on the line, then it justifies abandoning right. the way of Jesus in order to right. do what's necessary mm -hmm. to save yourself here, here. and those you love. You're here, here. And, yep. and that's what he's saying is, the, every, and it, that's right. it's wrong on so if many you, levels. If you, if you have to set aside the commands of Jesus in order to fulfill what you think is Jesus's agenda, we can be sure it's no longer Jesus you're following. Right? That's it. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming along this week. Hey, Mike Erie. Thanks for being here this week. I also had a, had a story about uh, the gender gap in voting and uh, in a church attendance, but I thought that Mike might not be the best surrogate for Caitlin <laughs> in discussing <laughs> gender issues. So we're holding oh, yeah. that story until next week. And everybody, go sign up for the Esau Macaulay podcast on Apple Podcasts. So we spike him right to the top and a bunch of people discover what he's doing because it's going to be great. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. The Holy Post podcast is sponsored by Brooklyn Bedding. Even the toughest days look better when you've had a good night's sleep and the quality of your mattress can make a huge difference. Maybe it's time to upgrade your sleep with a new mattress from Brooklyn Bedding. Brooklyn Bedding offers an award-winning lineup of mattresses with different firmness levels, heights, dimensions, and prices. You can take their sleep quiz to find the right one for you and your new mattress will ship free from their own factory in Arizona right to your front door. Best of all, they'll let you try it for 120 days to make sure you love it. It took Lisa and I years to find the right mattress for us. Now is the perfect time for you because Brooklyn Bedding is offering up to 25% off site-wide for Holy Post listeners. Go to brooklynbedding.com slash holy post. That's brooklynbedding.com slash holy post. This is their best offer yet and it won't last long. Upgrade your sleep with Brooklyn Bedding today. And thanks to Brooklyn Bedding for sponsoring this episode. This episode is sponsored in part by World Relief, the Christian humanitarian organization we trust to boldly engage the world's greatest crises in partnership with the church. Many of you have compassionate hearts toward the 120 million men, women, and children who've been forced to flee their homes. But I wonder how much do we really know about mass displacement and its impact on families and children? I'd like to invite you to test your knowledge with a short quiz from World Relief at worldrelief.org slash holypost.
host. Along with the quiz, you'll have an opportunity to grow in your understanding of refugee resettlement with World Relief's free Intro to Resettlement e-learning course, a short, self-paced resource with a ton of great information about the global context of resettlement, the process of resettlement within the U.S., and the role of organizations like World Relief. If you feel the weight and urgency of the displacement crisis or just want to learn more, then take the quiz today and get your free e-learning course, too. Head on over to worldrelief.org slash holypost or look for the link in today's show notes. I love history. I love reading history. I love historical movies. I love going to museums. In fact, I even majored in history in college. And that's why it bothers me so much when other people don't understand history. And it's why I'm so grateful for our guest today, Sharon McMahon. For a long time, she taught government and law in high school. But during COVID, she started an Instagram account called Sharon Says So to teach other people more about American history, government, and law. In a time when flashy headlines and false information has taken over everywhere, millions have now come to rely on McMahon for nonpartisan, fact-based information that's informed by really good history. McMahon has also just released a book that's already a bestseller called The Small and the Mighty, 12 Unsung Americans Who Changed the Course of History from the Founding to the Civil Rights Movement. She sat down with our own Caitlin Chess to talk about it and how we can find hope and resilience for today by learning these remarkable stories of the women and men who've come before us. And they talk about how McMahon navigates being a social media superstar without getting sucked into every controversy and fight online. Here is Caitlin's conversation with Sharon McMahon. Sharon, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's truly a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm so excited. I feel like I had to really pare down my questions for you because I've been following you online for a while and I'm so fascinated by what you do and how you do it. But let's start first just talking about your Instagram and your online community of people learning about the government. First, how did that start? For people who aren't familiar with you, tell us a little bit about what you do and how it came about. Mm. You know, I've been a government and history law teacher for many years. So I have a lot of both educational experience, like learning about these things in college, but also just a lot of professional experience with learning how to explain complicated topics in fact-based, nonpartisan ways, which is what you expect in a high school classroom, Mm -hmm. right? You want a teacher who can explain complicated things simply, uh, helps people learn how to think about things rather than just telling them what to think. And ultimately, in 2020, um, the world kind of imploded you know, depending on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, your own perspective. Most of us are not eager to replicate 2020 for a variety of reasons. Um, And there was a lot of political contention happening in the in 2020. And most people, doesn't matter who you voted for, most people feel like, I don't want to do that again. Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. was no bueno. Uh, So I started noticing some People who were confidently wrong on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm familiar uh-huh. with the phenomenon. Yeah. Uh-huh. 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 Confidently incorrect. Uh, who were saying things that were just demonstrably false, like mm. the Electoral College is a university you can graduate from. <laughs> like, that's not even, that's mm-hmm. not an opinion. That's just wrong. Chad, it yep. just is, yep. you know? So um, I decided in that moment that I could either reply to everybody who is confidently wrong and get into a million arguments with strangers on Facebook about like, actually, the Electoral College is a concept, not a location. Mm-hmm. Like, I could either do that or I could just make some fact-based nonpartisan explainer videos about how things actually worked that maybe would have some more longevity than just mm-hmm. a comment on Facebook. And so that's what I decided to do. I put started making some little videos and it turns out that people liked them. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it has blown up. You've done so many incredible things with it. But I I have enjoyed so much of it uh, myself online. And for people who are hearing you and going, yes, I totally relate to that experience of the internet. Also, whether they've encountered you before or not are thinking, oh, yeah, that's something I want. Can you talk a little bit about how you view your vocation and what you're doing? Like, what mm. what do you imagine people get out of this? What do you imagine your role is in people's lives? Because what you just described, and we can get more into this in a minute, but the internet is a rough 
place. And I Mm -hmm. think a lot of people are like, maybe I fully get out of politics. Maybe I fully get out of the internet because it is both are a hot mess. Mm -hmm. How do you think about what you're doing with the work that you're doing? Mm -hmm. Well, I view myself as a teacher and, you know, an educator. That's always been my vocation. I feel like it is truly my calling Mm -hmm. is uh, teaching. And so I don't view myself as like a pundit or a journalist. Now I'm a writer. I'm an author, you know, because I wrote a whole book. (laughs) But um, I, I fundamentally view myself as an educator. And so you know, when I think about conceptualize what it is that I do, I like to think about it in the sense of helping people learn how to think, not what to think. Mm -hmm. Any good teacher would rather have a student who can make a well-supported argument that arrives at a different conclusion than the one the teacher holds, than than a student who can memorize a list of dates and names and can regurgitate them for a test, but does not know how to apply any of it, doesn't actually understand how any of it fits with anything else. I would much rather have get into a spirited debate with somebody with a different view than me because that I can actually learn from that. Yeah. Right. If, even if I don't agree with that, every conclusion you arrive at, I can still learn from this conversation. So I don't have a fundamental motivation to try to convince people to think like me. I would much rather have everybody have critical thinking skills yeah. because ultimately that benefits all of us far more than y'all memorizing a list of, of talking points that I give you to memorize. You know, like the leaders in history who have just been like, here's what you need to think. Those have not been people worth following. Mm -hmm. You know, those have not been people who have led us to good places. So that's, you know, I just, I think about it as, um, you know, some people call me America's government teacher. I, Mm -hmm. you know, and if you want to call me that, that's fine. But I, I really view myself as, as an educator, um, and Maybe a philanthropist or a humanitarian, yeah. but not not journalist, um, and, and definitely not pundit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's so helpful, and it it's been helpful for me to be able to share things from someone that it's clear, you know, this is not pushing a particular agenda. This is information for people to think better, and I want to talk about this more in a minute, but also. So much of what you're doing is helping us think about how we have relationships with each other better or how Mm -hmm. we talk to each other better, Mm -hmm. um, which seems really hard. You're educating people in an internet ecosystem that is, as you said, rife with misinformation, also rife with vitriol and disgust of other people. And Mm -hmm. I have a lot of questions about the internet, but the main one is just how do you, how do you think about doing it well? How do you keep Mm -hmm. yourself from being shaped and formed by it? Because I've been so encouraged watching, even in the last few months, your ability to say, hey, political violence, wrong regardless of who it's against. Mm -hmm. Or this way that we've learned to talk to each other, not a good way. Even if you think you're totally right and you're defending vulnerable people, this isn't how we talk to each other. But I've even felt in myself how difficult it is to spend time on the internet and be formed in the ways of speaking that we learn to be formed Mm -hmm. in and resist mm-hmm. that. How have mm-hmm. you managed to do that? Mm. Well, first of all, imperfectly, right? I yeah. I do not hold myself up as any kind of paragon of virtue. Um, it is sometimes a daily struggle to not uh, not get into arguments with with people who are confidently wrong. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, my knee jerk reaction, especially when I know I'm right and somebody else is being a jerk, mm-hmm. my knee jerk reaction is uh, to be snarky. Yeah. Uh, I am married to a multiple time national debate champion. Okay. Uh, he, and that's not, that's not an exaggeration. Mm -hmm, He mm -hmm. has won both high school and college national debate champions. He, he, uh, coached high school and college debate. This man is very talented. Okay. I regularly win arguments against him. <laughs> <laughs> I know I could take you down yeah, if I wanted yeah. to. You know what I mean? Uh, and I'm, that's not coming from a place of self-importance. It's just like yeah, I know yeah. that I could make you look really dumb right now yeah. if I wanted to. Uh, and it requires like a, a high amount of discipline to, on a daily basis, um, not show up to every fight I'm invited to. Because I'm invited to a lot of fights. Yeah. And uh, in the same way, like when I was in the classroom regularly and kids would say to me, like, 
oh, I don't want to do this. This is homework. This is blah, blah, blah. Oh, why do we have to take a test today? Whatever it is. Kids complain about things. It's just mm-hmm. human nature. Um, I didn't. The worst thing a teacher can do, and any teacher will tell you this, is get into a fight with a child, <laughs> right? Like, well, uh-huh. Chad, it's good for you to take tests. You're like, the worst <laughs> thing you can do is get into a fight. The mm-hmm. best thing you can do is, is uh, from a place of like sort of friendly detachment, mm-hmm. say, yeah, I know it's not the most fun to take tests. And that's the end of that. You know what I mean? (laughs) Um, Or like, oh, I hear you, man. And that's all you got to say. I I feel you. And you keep passing out the papers. Um, I don't need to get into every fight with a a student. And I don't need to get into a fight with everybody on the internet. Because as a teacher, I know it's not productive to get into a fight with, um, with Sarah about whether we should be doing homework tonight or not. That is not a productive use of my time. I'm not actually helping any students learn by getting into a fight with with any student about what we're learning that day or what is real or what's true or if we should turn off the light or turn it on or we, we should kick people. Like I, getting into fights with you is not actually educating anybody. Yeah. So one of the things I always come back to is what is my important work? Mm. And when I'm in a classroom of 16-year-olds, my important work is not getting into fights with Sarah. I can tell you that much. Yeah, It is not um, getting into a, a back and forth with Aiden about whether or not an 89.4 is an A or a B. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Oh, I feel Aiden, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's not my important work in that moment. Yeah. And I regularly reorient myself toward that in on the internet what is my important work and i have decided that my important work is not arguing with strangers in the comments that's yeah. not my important work that's not what anybody's going to put in on my epitaph that's not going in the obituary in the newspaper nobody's going to mention that at my funeral uh that i got in a bunch of sick burns uh-huh. on a daily basis uh, i hope that's not what i'm remembered for yeah. I hope my my descendants someday um, read my words and watch me on podcasts. Uh, hello, future descendants, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that someday my descendants look back on me as somebody to be proud of. Mm-hmm. And I don't I don't think the way to get there is to just engage in endless snarkiness. Yeah, on the internet. That's that's so helpful. And one mm-hmm. more question about the internet before we move on to your really wonderful book. But so there's that problem of of the way that we are tempted into all of these awful ways of relating to each other. Then there's something else I've noticed about your work, and it's in the book as well, is a real concern that we not be shaped into anxious, fearful people because mm-hmm. there are people mm-hmm. who will profit off of our fear. Can you talk a little bit about about that dynamic that I think we just need to make clear for people? how people benefit from your fear, but also how you resist that. Because I hear Mm -hmm. from people constantly, people who listen to this podcast who are like, I want to be politically involved. I want to be educated. And I am scared. And I don't like the person it turns me into. I'm trying to just do the good citizen thing. But somewhere along the way, who I was listening to, the podcast or the, you know, the TikToks or whatever, or the cable news, for goodness sake, Mm -hmm. I end Mm -hmm. up being fearful of my neighbor, fearful of the future of my country. How do you remain non-anxious, not just for the sake of not being anxious, but for the sake of of actually being a better citizen? Mm. It's a great question. And I know for sure that this is something that people in my community struggle with. It's a very common, normal human struggle. So if that is, you know, if you're listening to this and you resonate with that, don't feel like, oh, I'm just doing it wrong. I'm not meant for this. I'm not cut out for it. Um, All of human history uh, is made up of people who felt ill-equipped. In fact, the people who feel that they are equipped are often, as I mentioned, wannabe dictators. (laughs) They are the people who you should not be following. The people who are like, I alone can save us. Mm. I am uniquely equipped. Those are people who are like, where are you going? It's probably not anywhere good. So first of all, just know that um, history, your family, your community is not waiting for you to feel equipped. 
It's not waiting for you to feel uh, a lack of anxiety. It's not waiting for you to be picked or chosen. It's not waiting for you to uh, have all the right qualifications to get through all of the right degrees and read all the right books and listen to all the right podcasts. That is not what anyone is waiting for. And history is full of people who were just ill-equipped and kept doing the next needed thing. Mm. So I always try to remind myself of that, that that nobody is waiting for me to be um, the perfect whatever it is. And that history smiles kindly. And by history, I'm not just talking about the history books, because most of us don't imagine ourselves in history books. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about the, your own legacy, your own yeah. personal legacy with your with your community and your 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 houses of worship and your children and um, it, that history smiles kindly on the doers mm. and not on the critics, and you will be um, remembered far more kindly if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. So in terms of how to reduce anxiety, first of all, understand what your own limitations are and Mm -hmm. and embrace what your own limitations are. Um, Some of us are extremely sensitive and seeing one dog lost at sea is enough (laughs) to set us off Uh for a whole three days. You know, we all know the types of guys who are, ruined for a week when their favorite team loses right (laughs) like we all know the sensitive type yeah (laughs) um if you're one of those people accept that that's who you are and and understand your own bandwidth um and find ways to engage in uh, in government in politics in civics in a way that aligns with your own giftings, yes. in a way that aligns with your own interests. I really, I firmly believe that each one of us is given um, skills, talents, interests, callings, whatever you want to call it, that are things that we are meant to use. And, you know, I happen to be pretty good at teaching. I'm real bad at playing the trumpet. Okay, I don't know how to do that at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I can, if you're waiting on me to explore the ocean, my map would have a bunch of question marks and <laughs> sea serpents, right? You know, like question mm-hmm. mark, question mark, don't know what's over there. I'm not uniquely poised to take us to the moon. I don't understand how physics works. <laughs> I am only good at what I'm good at. Um, and yes, I can get better at n- new skills. Like, of course, we can all learn new things. But I would argue that I... Um, in my unique talents lie in this area and that I am meant to use these things in this way, much like every single other person who is listening to this mm-hmm. has their own unique talents, giftings, callings, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you are meant to use those things in that way and not to worry about how your thing is not the right thing. Of course, yeah. your talent is the right thing. Of course, it's the right thing. That's why you have it, because you bring something to the world that only you can bring. So um, I have a friend who uh, really wants to be civically engaged, but who is very sensitive and who really has a hard time watching the news. So I I told her, stop watching the news. Uh (laughs) You know, first of all, stop watching it. Um, Get one of those daily digests from a a reputable news organization that sends you an email, sometimes one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and you can read the headlines and you can click on the stories that you uh, are interested in. And it helps you feel like you're an informed citizen. But one of the ways that she gets involved civically is she... Uh, writes postcards for a candidate that she supports. That doesn't require her to get into arguments with anybody. She doesn't have to be in the Facebook group. She doesn't need to go on the protests and the marches. Some people are great at those things and that's that's needed and necessary too. But for my one specific friend, that gives her, she has so much social anxiety that she would never, ever, ever want to go to a parade and like have to march in a parade. (laughs) Forget it. But what she can do is write five postcards twice a week to people reminding them to vote. Uh, You know, she can volunteer in ways that align with her own skills. And so rather than thinking about like, I got to do, I have to personally save democracy. 
Yep. You know, like that's too big of a job for yep. one person. Yep. <laughs> um, if you think about it, of like I have to save democracy, well, you're going to be sorry at the end of the day because you probably will have failed. So instead of thinking of, about it as this massive problem that you alone can save, if all of us do what we can where we are with the resources available to us, that's enough. The weight of the world is not on any one of our specific shoulders. Yes. Um, that's enough. All of us doing something small will get us a lot farther than five of us trying to save democracy all by yes. ourselves. Yes. <laughs> so the, your important role is, is, is keyword important. Even yeah. if it seems small, that's an important role. And then the last thing I'll say about it, is that the seasons of your life will change. Mm. And what you are equipped to do in this moment may not be what you're equipped to do 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. um, when I had a newborn baby and was sleeping very little and was also trying to work full time and uh, trying to like, why do these children want to eat food every single night of the year? <laughs> and <laughs> why is the floor sticky? My my capacity in that moment is quite different than my capacity now. Uh, and that's not to say that my important work, that I wasn't doing important work by caring for that newborn. Um, but now my important work has evolved. That season of my life, I don't have a newborn anymore. My children don't wake up at 2.30 a.m. crying. <laughs> they actually sleep through the night now. In fact, sometimes it's difficult to get them out of bed. Um, <laughs> The my season of life has changed. And yeah. so my capacity has increased. And so I think it's important to remember that just because you might not have the capacity today doesn't mean you never will. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that you can build capacity is by just keep doing the next needed thing. Keep feeding the kids. Keep, keep breastfeeding the baby. What a, however you're feeding your baby, make sure, keep the baby happy. Um, take a take food to a, a person whose mom just died. Yeah. Um, keep putting one foot in front of the other because your capacity will change over time, and now is not forever. Yeah. Oh, Sharon, that's so helpful. I, our, our mutual friend Jamar Tisby, just a few weeks ago on the show said, you know, when when you are saved, the the God of the universe gives you gifts. And you don't have mm -hmm. to do other things than those gifts. Like use those gifts where you are planted and and stop thinking you have to save the whole world. You don't have mm -hmm. to save the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. A friend and I constantly joke now, every time we do any small little thing, we're like, that was saving democracy. That, that loaf right. of bread we baked, saving democracy. <laughs> that save baby democracy. cared for, saving democracy. <laughs> That's right. One baby at a time. Yep. One yep. loaf of bread at a time. <laughs> Which That's is really right. relevant to this book that you have written, this really beautiful mm -hmm. book, The Small and the Mighty. I just finished reading it. I told you before we got on, I really thought like Sharon's a big deal on the internet. She could write a meh book and it would be fine. And a lot of people would buy it. <laughs> she did not have to write such a truly good book. It is really mm -hmm. beautifully written. It, it moved you. me deeply. And Thank you. because of all of that, I'm curious about your choice to write this kind of book, mm -hmm. a book about American history, a book about untold stories of courage and goodness. You could have written a book that was, you are America's government teacher. You could have written a book that was an introduction to basic American government. I'm sure mm -hmm. there were publishers that were like, tell mm -hmm. the story of your social media rise. Or totally. There were other books that you could have written. Why mm -hmm. this book? Because I can imagine if I was someone in publishing or if I was someone on the internet, I might go, this is a strange choice. I'm so glad mm -hmm. you did it. But but why? Mm. Yeah, I think you're right that, you know, I, I know you're right in that there were publishers who wanted those other books that you're talking yeah. about. Um, and ultimately, it, it all comes back to this question of um, what is my important work and what is the best way that I can do that work? And ultimately, I feel like these stories illustrate so many of the things that I talk about far more beautifully than me just sharing my mm. own thoughts. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, have courage. You know, like I can say those words. <laughs> I can be like, 
Uh, keep doing important things, you know, like taking care of your baby is important. Your capacity can change over time. Like I can tell you all of these words and they might be true words. Um, but ultimately there is something about seeing what a real person did and lived through. In many cases, these people, mm -hmm. the people that I profile had life circumstances that you would never want to trade places with. Yeah. You would never be like, let me get those, let me get those life facts. Uh, some of these people have lived through um, extraordinarily difficult times and did something worth remembering in spite of it. Uh, and in some cases, because of it. Yeah. So there's something to be said for illustrating some of these ideas uh, with the actions of real people. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Jamar Tisby talks about uh, the community of ancestors from which we can draw. Mm -hmm. uh, when we feel low, when we feel like what we do doesn't matter, when we feel like I cannot bake one more loaf of bread, I just cannot do that. Um, we, we can look to people who light the way. Um, we can look to people who have lit the way in the past as as an example of how we might light the way for people for our descendants, for people of the future. Whether or not you go on to have 20 kids or 75 grandkids, um, you will have people who come after you who are depending on you mm -hmm. to to light the way. And I I love thinking about um how history brings me hope. Mm -hmm. And uh that's Certainly not every element of yeah. uh, the, this book is is hopeful because history is it's a real they're real stories, right? Yeah. History is full of real things and some of them are tragic. Um, it's not Marley and me. Yeah. It's not about <laughs> golden retrievers uh -huh. <laughs> who tear up a newspaper, but ultimately they get engaged at the end. You know what I mean? Like that's yes. <laughs> it's um, but yet. Um, the the real truth of their lives, I think, is far more impactful than some tidily packaged yes. um, Hallmark movie of the big city attorney who goes home to help her dad save his small business in the small town. And she meets a cute but uneducated boy, you know, and has to leave behind her high-powered sports car driving uh -huh. boyfriend who's actually kind of a jerk. <laughs> um, those stories are fun to watch, of course. But we all know they're not real. Yeah. Uh, but the stories in this book are. And I think hearing about them, you know, like even thinking about some of these people can bring tears to my eyes. If I think yeah. about them too long, yeah. they bring tears to my eyes uh, with with who they managed to become yes. uh, despite their circumstances. Yeah, I love that. The whole time I was reading the book, I was thinking – Sharon is giving us an imagination for a different way of being in our communities that, yeah, if it was just sort of didactic list of things to do and not do, it would not spark that imagination in you that then you could apply in your own context. Um, I have to admit, I thought about asking you, like, what's your favorite story in the book or your favorite person? And I decided that as much as I am curious about that, I really know who I want to hear you talk about, mm -hmm. which is Septima Clark. I mean, there were so many stories in the book that I thought were really profound and moving, but that's one that I think, especially folks who listen to The Holy Post, I'm sure this is a name they have not heard. And I think it's a story that if you could just give us the short version of it, I think illustrates what we've been talking about in terms of how how this book moves us. I love Septima. She's one of my favorite people in the book. So that answers your okay, first great, question. Okay, great. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, she's she's an example of somebody who has a set of life circumstances that you would never want to trade yeah. places with. She uh, gets married, has a baby daughter, and the baby daughter dies of an undiagnosed birth defect. She contemplates suicide. She's become almost suicidal and is sort of saved at the last moment. And she just has another baby and discovers that her husband has a secret second life that he is married to an entirely separate woman with more children. And then shortly after discovering this, he dies. And she is left trying to care for her own newborn son or her own young son at a time when it was difficult for women, for single moms, to literally make ends meet. We didn't have a social safety net. Uh, many jobs were not open to women. And many jobs especially were not open to Black women. And so to care for her child was a significant hardship. And she goes on to become a teacher and she becomes a teacher 
uh, in one of the barrier islands off the coast of South Carolina um, because she's not allowed to get a job in Charleston where she lives uh, as a black woman. She wasn't even allowed to teach in segregated schools mm -hmm. that served black children. They just didn't hire black teachers. So she has to leave the community she uh, grows up in. She gets this job on this little island and the school for the school for black children on that island was very dilapidated. It did not have any glass in the windows. All they had were shutters. And so in order to keep the bugs out, they would have to close the shutters. And the children were having school in the actual dark. And this school was called Promise Land School. Mm. And I, you know, I can promise you that Septa McClark did not think, well, this is the promised land. Mm. That is not what she thought in that moment. And she probably also did not think, wow, I am about to go down in history. <laughs> right? <laughs> she did not think to herself, wow, I'm really about to make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. She probably looked around and was like, what in the Sam Hill is going on here? <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't yeah. even have glass in the windows. Uh, she was very, very well acquainted with the injustice that she was, that uh, she was encountering on a daily basis. Well, ultimately, uh, Septima's life is spared a bunch more times. The police catch, ch uh, catch people who are on their way to firebomb her house and she survives like a bus crash and all kinds of like just crazy things happen to her. And ultimately she is fired from her job. Uh, she gets a job eventually in Charleston County Pub or in Charleston public schools. She's fired from her job because she refuses to to pretend that she's not a membership or she, that she's not a member of the NAACP. She refuses to pretend that. So she's fired. And she goes on to do something uh, really, really remarkable with her life. Uh, and I'll save some of it for the book, but she, mm -hmm. she goes on to teach the greats of the civil rights movement, like Rosa Parks and John Lewis. Uh, and it, she, she would have never had the opportunity to do that had this other thing not happened to her. Uh, much like I would not have the opportunity to even write this book had COVID not occurred, right? Like I would not have mm. had time uh, to leave my other profession and to start doing what I'm doing now. So that's part of the lesson is that sometimes these terrible things uh, happen. Um, things have to fall apart in order to fall into place. But the thing that I keep coming back to with Septima Clark, she has many enemies who, not because she's not likable, not because she does things that are um, harmful to others, but by very virtue of who she is, by working for justice, by working for equality, that sets a population of her community against her. Mm -hmm. And at the end of her life, somebody asks her, you know, what have you learned? And one of the things that she says is, I have learned that I can work with my enemies because they might have a change of heart mm. at any moment. Mm. And I was just like, dang it, that's so good. Yes, I can work with my enemies because the current political climate is if we are enemies, and by by nature, if I'm voting for Bob and you're voting for Lisa, we're enemies, mm -hmm. right? Like that is how uh, the culture has by and large evolved. If you're voting for candidate A and I'm voting for B, we're enemies. Um, listen, Septima had some real enemies. Like they were trying to firebomb her house. They falsely arrest her. She's, you know, like there's the things that happened to her are astounding. She had real enemies, but she says, I have learned that I can work with my enemies, not just tolerate my enemies, not live across the street and smile at my enemies, not, not exist on Instagram with my enemies or be in a cubicle next to my enemies. I can work with them. And, and she says, why? Because they might have a change of heart at any moment. And she had seen it happen mm -hmm. over and over again. People had a change of heart. And the question I am left with by learning about her story and by telling her story is, how will your proverbial enemies, political or otherwise, how will they ever have a change of heart if you refuse to work with them? Mm -hmm. If you refuse to love your enemies 
How mm. will they have a change of heart? They're going to keep on listening to their same old cable news station mm -hmm. that says people like you are the worst and you're not saving democracy or ruining democracy. And everything about you and your group is terrible. We're going to hell in a handbasket. They're going to keep on thinking that same old thing. How will they ever have a change of heart if they are never around somebody to, sh to show them the light? And dang it, if Septima can do it, so can we. Yes, <laughs> yes I, I love that so much. Again, it puts in perspective the challenges yes. that we are facing, what she was yes. facing. And then I kept thinking, that was the moment that really got me was when she says that. But also thinking, wow, and I could have a change of heart at any moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. who knows how I could be convinced or changed or I could learn something. And I think a lot of the people who listen to this podcast, we forget we had a change of heart at some point. Like most mm -hmm. of the people listening have changed their minds, maybe sometimes quite significantly about some political yeah. things. 2020, 2016, like these were revelatory moments for a lot of people. And somehow we fall into this belief that like I could change, but other people couldn't change. You know, they're mm -hmm. stuck in their ways and I'm not. Um, Sharon, with the last few minutes that we have, just thinking about the stories that you tell in this book and kind of the hope that you have that they will shape people's understandings and imagination for how they live their lives. Give us some sense of how either a story from this book or the kind of combination of them together, how would you have those stories for people who will pick up this book shape how they interact with their neighbors, how they live during even these next few months, which will be, as you pointed out, we're just human and this is hard and people are angry and things are scary. And we feel pretty hopeless um, and we don't need cheery optimism, like everything's going to be fine. But I think the stories in your book give us some sense of how we could find some other way to be mm -hmm. hopeful that isn't just mm -hmm. naive optimism or kind of cliche platitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. I, I really think, you know, one of the things that I hope people take away is that hope is not a feeling mm. that you should wait around to have descend upon you. Mm -hmm. I think we often think of hope and uh, as like laughter. It's like, oh, you made me laugh. You're so funny. Oh my gosh, you're so hilarious. <laughs> uh -huh. You know, like I love that comedian. He says the funniest thing. Um, his jokes are the best. We wait for somebody else to create an opportunity for us to laugh at, right? Most of us are not sitting alone in a room laughing to ourselves unless we're like literally watching something on TikTok uh -huh. or whatever. Um, so we wait, we think hope is something that other people will provide to us or a feeling that we are waiting to experience. And we're going to wake up in the morning and the skies will be blue and the birds will be chirping and the coffee, coffee will hit just right and uh, they turn on the news and they'll be like, well, I don't have anything for you today. It's all looking pretty good out there. Like we're just going to, we're waiting for the perfect set of circumstances to have hope. And history is full of people who did not believe that, who believed that hope was a choice. It was an action. It was doing things. That it was not sitting around waiting to feel a feeling or waiting to be provided with an opportunity to feel hope from another person. That hope came from actually moving your hands and feet and not just moving your mouth. Mm -hmm. And the people in this book and tens of thousands, maybe millions of others like them, just kept doing the next needed thing. Mm -hmm. Whether they could see, like Septima Clark walking into Promised Land School, did not feel an overwhelming sense of hope. No beam of light descended from the sky. She did not see a rainbow above her school that morning. You know what I mean? She didn't feel this incredible sense of like, oh my gosh, so optimistic. Everything's great. She didn't feel that yeah. way. But she chose to, kept, to keep doing the next needed thing because that is hope that if I do the next needed thing, that we can make change. We can, my efforts will matter someday. Yeah. Even if we can't see it in this moment. When Septima died as an old woman, she had been on the Charleston school board after being denied oppor the opportunity to even be employed there. Um, and she would definitely say that all of my life circumstances were used 
I used everything I learned from everything I experienced. And I just kept trusting and having hope that what I did would matter someday. And here we are. What she did absolutely did matter. And uh, she deserves the statues as much as anybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, But honestly, the biggest testament to her legacy is for all of us to start moving our hands and feet and stop running our mouths. Sharon, thank you. Thank you for your time today. And thank you for this really remarkable book that I would I would highly recommend people pick up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media, produced by Mike Stralo, editing by Seth Gorvett. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by subscribing to Holy Post Plus at holypost.com slash plus. Also, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much, much more.